Hello world, Lisa Fredrickson, your friend and computer science professor with another short screencast. This time we're in the textbook series. If you're using this textbook or a previous version, we're going to be talking about chapter five. In chapter five, you're going to learn more about CSS as well as how to insert images on the web page. You're going to learn three different ways of inserting images on a web page. So at this point, because your CSS file is growing, I highly recommend that you use comments to provide some organization to your style sheet. We're going to start off with the body selector because that's the entire body. Then next we see the header on the web page. And next is navigation and headings. So a few sprinkled comments can really improve the readability. Now, one of the hardest declarations that you're going to write in chapter five is that of the font family. And the reason it's so difficult is because the value breaks all of the rules that you may have previously learned. You've learned prior to this, if you've read the book carefully and watched my YouTubes, that you cannot have spaces in values. So even if we put a space up here between 400 and the percent sign, that would not work. Between the 1 and M, that would not work. Those would throw validation errors, and you'd need to fix that. But look in the font family rule, we have spaces because we're providing different choices for the font family separated by commas. So this value does have spaces in it. It also has capital letters, which is again a new thing in the property values that you've not seen before. And that's because font names are proper names. So Georgia and Times New Roman are proper names and are properly capitalized. You also see quotation marks around Times New Roman because of the spaces. So those quotation marks pull those three words together into one value for the style sheet to read. And finally, we finish that font family rule with a generic font name in case the browser can't read Georgia and the browser can't read Times New Roman. At least we are providing a generic font name, serif, which means the best font that you have with the little hats and the little feet. That's a serif font for these three selectors. I put these three elements in a combination selector separated by commas so that I didn't have to repeat that same rule and the H1, H2, and H3 selectors. It helps me cut down on the size of my style sheet and also helps me follow the concept of dry, don't repeat yourself. There's other places in the style sheet where you can combine the selectors because you have the same declaration. And if you notice that, it's just good to cut down on your style sheet as much as possible. Because now, if I wanted to change the font names in that font family, I'd have one place to change it instead of three. So that's the most difficult declaration that you'll write in chapter five. But I also want to go over now images and how those are taught in chapter five. In chapter five, you're going to put in three images if you're doing the Pacific Trails or the other end of chapter exercise. One is a background image, this little sunsets being put into the right side of the background of the header. And Personally, I think that background images should be background to text. If it's an image that's being placed on the page and it's like content on the page, you want to use the IMG, the image element, which is used for this particular image because it's the coastline of where we're going at the specific trails resort. So that's content on the web page. The third image is this little blue ball that you put in on the style sheet. And let's go and look at how that's done. So let's look at the style sheet and look at the header. The sunset image is put in through these three rules. We're specifying a background image, and we have to use the URL function to do that and reference that image name. Then we're putting it in a particular position on the right-hand side, and we're asking for it not to repeat. Again, you can use your comment syntax to comment out any one style, if you wish, and see what that looks like on your page. So here it's repeated, and so we realize, yes, we do need that no repeat rule in our style sheet. For the unordered list, we use the list-style-image property. We know our properties never have spaces, and the words are separated by dashes, and then we're just specifying the marker.gif file, which is that little blue ball. So that's how two of the images are inserted as a background image in the header, and also as a little blue ball for the unordered list. 
this image is put in through the HTML. Let's look at that. And here's our tag for image content. You always want to use the image tag for content on the page. And the image element has two essential attributes. SRC, which references the image name, and ALT, which is the alternate text for that image. And that's important for screen readers, for if your image breaks for any reason, you'll see that text on the page, and also for search engine optimization so that your image is indexed on search engines. These two attributes, though, I take issue with. The width, setting it at 100%, does make that image span across the screen. So it kind of forces it to look good. The height attribute of 349, that's 349 pixels. If we look at this image in paint, we can see here at the bottom that it's 1,000 pixels wide by 349 pixels tall. And so that's why this 349 is sitting here in the height. So we're setting the height to a fixed size, and then we're stretching the image to be 100% of the screen. Now, the only reason this works is because this image is of rocks and rocks can be skewed out of proportion and still look okay. This is not a great way to code an image. First of all, with setting it at 100%, that doesn't validate cleanly. So the validator is telling you this probably is not the right technique you want to use. So let's compare that technique of inserting an image using a different image. I've chosen this image. It's 475 pixels wide by 214 pixels tall. I'm going to code that into my HTML with the new SRC property and the new height of the image. And when we save this and refresh this page, you're going to see how awful images with items that have specific proportions look when stretched beyond their actual size. So the only way she gets by with this is because our image is of rocks, which don't have a specific proportion. Later on in the next chapter, she's going to have you remove those attributes and use a background image on this div element to put the same image in. Again, you've got the same problems, though. You've got an out-of-proportion image that works well in this case because it's an image of rocks. So this is one area of the book that I really take issue with. What you're going to want to do is instead of stretching an image across a screen, you're going to want to write flexible images that look good on all screen sizes. The book does include how to do that in a later chapter. Realize that an image should be coded with just the SRC and ALT attributes and allowed to be the appropriate size, the actual proportions that it is on the screen. And if we look at that now, we see that this is the actual size of the image. And you may say, well, this doesn't look as well because it doesn't stretch across a screen. Well, you can handle that in different ways. We could put text on the right side of this image to balance it out a little bit, or we could center the image inside that area. There are different ways to handle making it look good rather than forcing it to skew clear across the page. So in my classes, when we write images, we include the SRC attribute, to identify the image, we include the ALT attribute to give it alternate text, and we use CSS to write flexible images that will resize to the appropriate size of the screen as we resize that screen. This is what you're going for. You want an image that resizes appropriately and in proportion at different screen sizes. And all of that happens as we move through this textbook. But just realize that for now, you're forcing the image to be the width of the screen. Not a good idea. Doesn't validate. Out of proportion. But it looks good for Chapter 5. To make an image flexible, you need only one simple rule. And that is the max width set to 100%. By using max width, 100%, we're saying, image, we don't want you to grow any greater than your natural maximum size. By using the percent sign, we're making the image flexible. So this is a simple technique that you'll learn later in the responsive web design chapter 
on how to make your images flexible. But if you want to know that right now, I wanted to provide this. If I go ahead and comment this out, I'll show you how the image looks without it being flexible. I'll save and refresh my page. And as I resize this browser, see how the right side of the image is being chopped off? If I put that rule back into my style sheet, save and refresh my page, now that image is growing and shrinking in proportion to the size of the browser, to the size of the viewport of the screen. And that's ultimately what we want. You're going to want to consult your instructor on how to best code this image. I personally have my students coded exactly as shown in the book, but I want them to be aware of the shortcomings, of the skewed proportions, and how to insert an image in a flexible way so that on their unique projects, their midterm and their final, they can code images properly. Thank you.